If you've got a passion for pumpkin, you've got to get to Dunkin' and pick these up. Our new pumpkin cream cold brew. Smooth, bold cold brew topped with velvety pumpkin cream cold foam. And our delicious pumpkin spice signature latte. Rich espresso topped with whipped cream, caramel drizzle, and cinnamon sugar. And our perfectly pumpkin donuts, munchkin treats, pumpkin muffins, and more. That's how we pumpkin at Dunkin'. Pick your pumpkin at Dunkin', like our new pumpkin cream cold brew. Pumpkin spice signature latte. And our perfectly pumpkin treats. America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Exclusions apply. Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm your host, John Williamson. And uh, this week, uh, we have an interesting, kind of a unique episode. But before that, I uh, just want to make sure that if uh, you're new to the podcast, thanks for listening. Uh, please check out our website, www.thedeconstructionist.com, to listen to our entire back catalog of episodes, link to us on social media, read our blog, um, snag a t-shirt or a pie class from our web store, or even support us by joining our Patreon family that you can link to from the site. This episode was originally released from my other podcast project from the void. So it'll sound a little different than what you're used to. For those of you who have listened to The Deconstructionist for a while now, you've probably been aware that we tend to do a little more topical episodes around Halloween. And so this year, it just so happened that one of the interviews I conducted for the From the Void podcast covered a topic that we've addressed here before. So several years ago, uh, we interviewed Harvard neurosurgeon Dr. Eben Alexander and talked all about his near-death experience. And to this day, it remains one of our more popular episodes. Recently, I had the pleasure of speaking with Kimberly Clark Sharp for the From the Void podcast about her near-death experience and her subsequent work as a social worker and researcher on the subject. Kimberly was recently featured on the first episode of the Netflix docuseries Surviving Death and is the author of the book After the Light, What I Discovered on the Other Side of Life That Can Change Your World. So depending on, you know, no matter where you kind of fall on this on this subject, I think it's always uh, fascinating and, and very, very interesting uh, to kind of dive into this and see what commonalities are experienced amongst people who have claimed to have had these experiences. So... Hopefully you enjoy the episode. Uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks uh, with more regular kind of uh, topics on this uh, on this uh, podcast. So, in the meanwhile, hopefully you enjoy this episode. And as always, happy Halloween! From the darkest reaches of space to the deepest corners of your mind, your mind. Welcome to From the Void. One of the questions humankind has been asking since the beginning of time is, what happens after we die? Religion tells us that perhaps we go to heaven or reincarnate depending on which system of beliefs you ascribe to. Atheists might claim that nothing happens, that we go to sleep and never wake up, that in all of our complexity and self-awareness that eventually, one day, we simply stop existing. Even science has attempted to find the answer. Are we more than just our brains? Does something like a soul exist? And if it does, and consciousness is more than just organic matter, does it survive the death of the physical body? And if so, where does it go? Reports of near-death experiences have been around for generations. Are they real, valid experiences that prove that something exists post-death? A kind of glimpse through the veil that divides the physical world from the spiritual? Or are they examples of hallucinations brought on by a chemical release as the body starts to shut down? This week, I welcome Kimberly Clark Sharp, who had her own personal experience that left her forever changed. Kimberly is an author, speaker, teacher, and researcher whose experience led her to a career in social work where she was a pioneer in the field of critical care social work, founded the Seattle International Association of Near-Death Studies, and published the book, After the Light, The Spiritual Path to Purpose. Welcome to this week's mystery, Near-Death Experiences on From the Void. Okay, very excited to have Kimberly Clark Sharp on the podcast this week. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. 
Well, John, it's actually a pleasure to be with you <laughs> in every way possible. I'm very happy to be here and to be interviewed by you. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, Pete, the, the, what the listeners don't know is, is the battle that we went through to make this happen, right? So, <laughs> If anyone knows what a Luddite is, <laughs> that would be me. Um, Let's put it this way. I still have an AOL email account. That's how bad I am at technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got there. That's the important thing. We, we made it to the finish line. So, <laughs> Yay! Well, tell people a little bit about your uh, your background to start with before we get into the topic at hand, because I think it, it's a, a really uh, interesting field that you're in that caters well to the, the topic. Okay. Well, by background, I'm from Kansas. Um, May 25th of 1970, I actually collapsed with my dad at the Department of Motor Vehicles in Shawnee Mission, Kansas, and um, needed resuscitation. And it was a prolonged resuscitation. I had what we now call a near-death experience with bells and whistles. And then uh, moved into the next stage of after effects from an NDE, first stage being being alive. I mean, that's the, the very first outcome is, wait, I'm back. Um, but I, like pretty much everyone who's ever had a near-death experience, I was changed. Uh, Kansas was too small. I love my family, but I left them. And made my way to Seattle, Washington, which is what I'd been shown in my near-death experience. Uh, And John, to be honest, I'm spoiled rotten. I was sent back to serve. And to, and maybe we should have begun with my near-death experience upon reflection. You want to hear it real quick? I would love to, Absolutely. All right, this, you know, by the way, listeners, this is not rehearsed in case you haven't <laughs> figured that out. John and I are just talking like That's two right. old friends, but I, I like him, so <laughs> keep listening to his podcast. Uh, all right, so let's go back to 1970, Shawnee Mission, Kansas, at the Department of Motor Vehicles with my dad. That day, I... Uh, was a normal human being. I was, I was kind of young. I was a college student. Did I mention Kansas? I mean, I lived in a bubble. There was no, there weren't race riots. There weren't, uh, you know, Democratic convention brawls. I mean, I really was in a bubble um, of um, innocence and inexperience in life. Plus, I hated change. So I was very happy where I was. Anyway, upon leaving the DMV, I collapsed and fell into and through my dad's arms, hit the ground. Uh, This is my dad's perspective, by the way, that I'm sharing. I don't have a memory of what I'm talking about right now. Uh, But a uniformed nurse happened to be passing by. She trotted over, determined I didn't have a pulse, that I wasn't breathing. So this is just before 911. So two calls were made. One to the closest hospital, which actually was in Kansas City, Missouri. They were sending an ambulance. And also to the volunteer fire department in Shawnee Mission. They, of course, were closest. So they they got there first. They had a brand new, according to my father, because they opened packaging, a brand new portable ventilator. It had two functions. One, of course, to ventilate, which is what you want in a ventilator but also a function with a flick of a switch that would vacuum instead of ventilate. And that was because some people get food caught in their throats, and that object has to be removed to clear the airway. So we tell our children, don't run with candy in your mouth. It's really good advice. Anyway, they applied the seal to my face and turned it on, and it was on vacuum mode. So my diagnosis when I finally made it to St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City was suffocation. Um, they immediately knew what was wrong. And, and honestly, John and listeners, these are probably farmers. I mean, there was never any ill will from my dad or, or medical personnel or anything. They clearly were doing the best they could with the equipment that they had. 
But anyway, they flicked a switch and started the air going in. But um, our lungs are very moist, and when they come in contact with themselves, uh, they have to get unstuck. And that's usually steady air pressure in the hospital on a ventilator or something similar. So the volume of air going in suddenly had really nowhere to go, and it found its way to my skin, and I inflated like a balloon. It's called epithelial emphysema, normally fatal. So now I'm like a couple ways dead. And a man that my dad always called the Good Samaritan came out from the back of now quite a crowd because, you know, there's a girl dead on the sidewalk in Shawnee Mission, Kansas. So that attracted, even before cell phones and internet, I'm just imagining, you know, Edna, get down to the DMV. There's a girl dead on the sidewalk. So according to my dad, it was quite the crowd. But from the back of this crowd came a man, and he said he had a lot of swear words, apparently. <laughs> and he um, said, we're not getting, you know, you'll never get her to breathe that way. And he sort of took over, and we have no idea who he was. He just remained always the Good Samaritan. Uh, but he did mouth-to-mouth, and who knows what else. By then, my uh, the firefighters were telling my dad, we're sorry, and I'm married to a firefighter, so I know the drill. Only a physician in the United States can pronounce death. So there's euphemisms like, I'm so sorry, or we're not getting a thing, which is what the swearing bystander was saying, except there were swear words in there. My dad's memory fades at that point. However, an ambulance did arrive finally, and um, I, I was breathing on my own. There was This was now sidewalk theater because my dad said people were hooting and clapping and everyone wanted me to live and uh, go figure. So uh, my body was thrown into the back of the ambulance. My dad jumped in. Off we went to St. Luke's. Apparently in the emergency room, things went sour again. Uh, By the way, my admitting, I pulled my medical records because I wanted to know what was said about me. My admitting temperature, body temperature was 86 which is getting there. Yeah, we, we run a lot warmer than that. Nice temperature for a backyard pool, but not for our body. And um, the I, you can't chart like this in, in a medical chart, what I'm about to say, but it was the words were primary diagnosis unknown because of snafu with a ventilator. And I, I was reading my, <laughs> my hospital records going, I'm a snafu. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so I did write this book called After the Light, and I hate to give away the end of a good book, but she lives. Which <laughs> we don't know that till right. you know the final chapter. Anyway, I don't remember that. Here's what I remember: uh, a woman's voice to my left saying, "I'm not getting a pulse." Me turning to her and going, "Of course you're getting a pulse. Otherwise, I wouldn't be speaking." She ignored me. She was so stressed. It was kind of annoying. So I, I don't know if it was a near-death snit or what, but I just thought, well, I'm out of here. I found myself next in a different environment. It was warm. It was like foggy material. I knew I wasn't alone, but I couldn't see who else I was with. I felt like this is where I was supposed to be. This was as natural as taking a breath. Um, I felt like I was in anticipation, but calm anticipation. Uh, Like anyone would feel, you got your boarding pass and you're at the gate and the plane has arrived. You're just waiting for your aisle to be called or your seat aisle. You know, it was just like, yeah, okay, this is this is okay. And then um, exploding under me was a light that was. I'd like to say brighter than a million suns, but I've never even stared at our own sun. So I don't know where I'd get that idea. There's a million suns, but it was so bright. I could see something I've never figured out. How can I see without eyeballs? Our eyes are in our physical body. How are people like me now that I've met? Um, You've had near death experience. How are we seeing anything? I don't get that part. Um, Then uh, this light, which was made entirely of love and frankly quite personal, um, spread out in all directions. I immediately said the words homey home, which I later learned from my family 
uh, I was first born, so everything was a Gucci goo moment, you know, got recorded in my baby book. So homey home is what I used to say when I was learning language, when I was, you know, we're pulling back into our street and I was recognizing the landmarks around our neighborhood and I would go, homey home, homey home. Such a cute moment for parents. I don't remember any of that. I was probably about two. But yet I said, homey home. And I had no idea I ever uttered those two words in my life. Um, the light also, uh, you know, my resuscitation wound up to be an hour and a half. So you know, a lot happened. Anytime you get bored, just cut me off, John. No, this is great. You know? Yeah, this is fascinating. I said I'd make it quick. And now I'm, <laughs> no, no. People are anyway, going to want to hear this. Yeah. Well, the light, again, impossibly bright and also just love. Just uh, so much love. I think if I were in the flesh, I would just be burnt to a crisp. I mean, I, I couldn't take it. No, no, too much love. But I I loved it. I loved the love. Anyway, the light went out in all directions around me. And also in a way I've never really fully been able to find words for, but it was doubling back on itself endlessly. And somehow I knew that I was beholding eternity itself. Which begs so many questions. Like, well, then where have we been? Where are we from? Where are we going? And, and what? But I somehow knew that that spreading out of the light to infinity and beyond, as Toy Story so wisely stated, uh, that that was the linear time, not necessarily on Earth, just time. But the layering, endlessly layers, were dimensions. So I'm scratching my head and your listeners can't see that. It's like, what the heck? You know, we know about three dimensions, but um, anyway, I, again, I somehow in my near-death experience, I understood it all. Out of my near-death experience, I'm going, what the heck happened? So, but it was beautiful, and I loved it, and I loved the love. And it, I, this light I call God, but those are just three little English Latin-based letters. I mean, you can say Bubba I, you know, with a certain amount of reverence, but there's no name that I can apply. But God is, everyone understands when I say God showed up. And, but it's not gender specific either, by the way. It's just love. I like to say my creator. How's that? I felt like homey home. This is where I'm from. This light created me. This light is my source. This light is my everything. It's my heart and soul and everything. So I wanted to stay with the light, but I was told I had to go back. And it was like, oh, so God is fallible because you just made a mistake, God. I'm not going back. <laughs> <laughs> and I argued. It was like, no, yes, no, yes. And I'm here to say you can argue with the big G. doesn't mean you're going to win, but you know, <laughs> arguing is allowed. So I was sent back, and I failed to mention that at the DMV, I did not get a driver's license because I couldn't parallel park. I would get between three to six feet of the curb and then give up. So, like, come back. And I hadn't done that yet. Obviously, I was just leaving. So I was sent back, and here I'd had the most spiritual experience I could possibly, I couldn't even imagine, but yet, all I can think of was a joke, because I was like next to myself by about three to six feet, and my first thought was, "I can't even park myself." I mean, <laughs> I missed myself. It's like I can't even get into my body. I mean, it was. Uh, it wasn't alarming. It was just like, well, huh? If I'm there, then who's doing all this thinking? And I realized the me that was me was not in that flesh. Cute as it was, but that's not the real me or the real you, John, or the real listener. We are more than, than as we appear. Um, these are like suits. One near-death experiencer in Olympia, Washington, calls us meat puppets. Uh, another near-death experiencer in Mexico calls us bags of water <laughs> i mean but we're 
but anyway, my my identity, my sense of self, my sense of, oh, I am Kim, was not in that body. Then I saw a man I didn't recognize lean over, and he put his mouth against mine. Well, that was a good Samaritan. So I did observe that. And then, drum roll, I went back into my body through him. And as I went through him, I knew everything about the guy. It was amazing. What I mainly knew, though, was that he was a total stranger, yet he had compassion. I had just been with the greatest love of all, so I was going to recognize it in something else. Compassion is a very pure form of love. And uh, I think it was he was like a lighthouse. And probably the physical contact helped. I don't know. But I went through him. I'm grateful to him. We have no idea who he was. He disappeared. So now I'm back in my body, and it's dark and cold, and I'm fully aware. I'm fully conscious, but I'm not awake. And I was miserable. So I called out to God again and said, you know, get me out of here. You know, homey home. I want to go home. I want to go home. God kindly showed up again. And boom, on my right was like a portal or a window, something like that. And through there was my heaven. Skeptics say, oh, near-death experiencers get what they expect. You know what I got? Kentucky. It looked like a Kentucky calendar picture. I've never been to Kentucky (laughs) (laughs) before, haven't since. That's one of the states I've just never managed to get to. And yet it was fields of beautiful, like meadow-like grasses kind of waving in a balmy breeze and off the distance, small white fence and some shrubby things. But what made it unearthly were two things. One is that the grass wasn't green. It was green, <laughs> and the sky wasn't blue. It was blue. <laughs> it was the intensity was not anything I've seen on Earth, photos or in person. Very intense colors. The other thing is that I was aware of the consciousness of every single blade of grass. It was alive, and it was countless. I mean, think about grass, but it was it was still life. And I wanted to go. So God told me that if I went through that window, that was my border and there'd be no coming back. So it's like, how many languages can I speak to say goodbye? (laughs) You know, au revoir, adios, I'm out of here, whatever. I headed through that window. And then there was a flash of light to my left. And I was told that if I chose to live, that's where I would be living. And it's where mountains met water. No map. Thank you very much, God. Um, But I knew it wasn't Kansas. So what did I care? I'm back through that window. And then another flash of light. And there was a gallery. It was like a portrait gallery of people, all strangers. But under each portrait was their um, role that they would have in my life if I chose to live. They were strangers. Again, what did I care? I'm off to Kentucky. And then there was a third flash of light. It showed me being of service, something I hadn't thought about doing in my whole life. And I said, cool. Well, it turns out God's a hippie because Mm -hmm. cool seemed to be an affirmation of, okay, I will go back to serve because then I was back. And uh, it was a blah, 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 back. You know, it was um, what the heck just happened. I mean, it was amazing. But Uh, As my life got lived, I did wind up in where um, mountains met water, which is Seattle. Uh, On the way, I I left, I bought a car. I learned to parallel park, kind of. (laughs) Not really, that's a lie. (laughs) But I want to feel somewhat adequate here during this interview. And um, I had a hamster named Toto. And I kept him in a birdcage. So I strapped Toto into the passenger seat, and off we headed to where mountains met water. It was random. I I headed west. We had a tornado outside of Hayes, Kansas. Uh, And I wound up in Seattle, absolutely the place where I was supposed to be. Lots of detours on the way. I had fun. I was young. What can I say? It was a good road trip Toto and I had. But... um, I wound up in in Seattle, Washington, which then as now is called the Emerald City. 
So I came from Kansas with Toto, had a tornado, and wound up in the Emerald City. Does that plot sound familiar? <laughs> so, so, the, so God has a sense of humor, is what you're saying. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, well, we can go back. Back when you know Toto and I were leaving, I seventy at that point was a toll, and the full weight of and I again I hate I, I still don't like change. I, I like routine. But back then, I really hated change, and this was the biggest change ever. I'm leaving Kansas. I'm leaving my family. I'm leaving everything but my ironing board, a trunk of clothes, and my hamster. I mean, it was insane, but yet I was doing it. Anyway, as I approached the I-70 toll booth, the weight of my decision hit me hard, and I started to cry. Not even cry, wail. I mean, really just wail like a baby. And I said out loud, you know, I hate change. I don't want to change. I want to go back. I hate change. I hate change. Here's God's sense of humor popped up in this moment and hasn't left me, by the way. Big sign came up that said, change needed. Well, of course, it was for the toll booth. But the timing was exquisite. So I was like, okay. And I'm sure my mom put the box of Kleenex next to my seat. But I said out loud, well, now I can use a Kleenex. And then I looked down and there's this box. It was white with black letters. And it said Kimberly Clark, which is my name. I married a Mr. Sharp. Ergo, I'm Kimberly Clark Sharp. But anyway, stuff like that began to happen that never let up. Uh, also, what never let up were opportunities to be of service. So I, um, I've i never applied for a job. I never applied to graduate school. I was asked to do everything. My, my reference commonly now is that I live my life on the automatic door opener of the grocery store. I am always and famously always where I'm supposed to be to be of the most help. And as it turns out, Seattle has more survivors than any other part of the world because this is where Medic One was born. And uh, it's really hard to die in Seattle. You can almost die, but resuscitation, uh, successful resuscitations, which means going back to normal job and life, uh, are like at 60% here, whereas in oh, New York it's 3%, in Detroit it's zero. So I'm, I'm now in a place where I can be of service because there are people having what we call near-death experiences. But that term hadn't been coined yet. So time marches on, seven years to be exact. I've now gone uh, through the School of Social Work at the University of Washington. I'm a University of Washington uh, social worker. Uh, I remain, by the way, a licensed clinical social worker. I've retired from the University of Washington. I've only retired from making money. I'm still working every bit as hard as I used to. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, so um, my point about all that is that in a university setting, one needs a gig. I had ambition. I wanted to get places academically. And that meant research, which I really enjoy. I just couldn't find anything that rang my chimes. But um, one day, a a woman had been admitted the night before where I worked, which is Harborview Medical Center, still in place in Seattle. Uh, It's the trauma center then, again as now, for one-fourth of the land mass of the United States. This joint is huge. And I was a social worker on intensive care and coronary care, backed up in the burn unit and in the emergency room. So people were flatlining. They were dying every day. And, John, I was really good at my job. I was, I mean, it's like butterflies and birds came out of my mouth when I was comforting someone who was afraid of dying or comforting a family because their loved one had died. Whatever, I was just, dang, I was good. Well, I hadn't had the presence of mind to go, well, that's because you died. (laughs) (laughs) You came back and you know it's fabulous. I mean, I just didn't have all my, uh, my metaphor is that for anyone who's had a near-death experience, that before the NDE, 
uh, life is like a jigsaw puzzle and all the pieces are in place, we think. And then along comes the near-death experience and all the pieces go airborne and they land back on the card table. But there's no sense of, you know, what goes with what anymore. And that's what it feels like after a near-death experience. So I just moved on. I thought, okay, I'm now a licensed clinical social worker, so I can self-diagnose. You crazy girl. I mean, that's just how I felt. (laughs) You're nuts. So one of those days in April 1977, a woman named Maria was admitted to the coronary care unit. She'd come in the night before unconscious, needing resuscitation. She uh, was Hispanic, lived in another part of the state of Washington, never been to Seattle, first time in the big city, and, you know, she dies. Um, so as a social worker, I spent some time with her, finding a translator, finding money, finding her family, all the things that happen, and doing my best to comfort her with my high school Espanol. Um, nice lady. About three or so days after she was admitted, uh, I was up on the coronary care unit. Someone was flatlining. It was Maria. So I was part of the thundering herds that went to her room. A big, big response, uh, of course, and uh, I watched an easy resuscitation. And I left the room and went about to see other patients and such, leaving her unconscious but stable. Then I was paged back a few hours later because Maria was conscious and agitated, and the nurse was afraid that she would agitate herself right back into cardiac arrest. And she couldn't find the translator, so she called the social worker. So the social worker responded, yours truly. And um, so I'm going to extremely edit a long conversation between two people who didn't particularly have a shared language. But first, Maria said that uh, during her resuscitation, she found herself in the corner of the ceiling and was able to tell me what she saw. But she wanted to move on from that. And so did I, because I thought, well, hearing is the last sense to go. She probably heard everything and kind of put it together in the best way she could. Um, she was talking to the best and worst person possible, the best because I'd had a near-death experience, the worst because I'd already diagnosed myself as nuts. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, yeah, let's do move on. I, I knew perfectly well what it was like to be out of body and look at my resuscitation, but I hadn't dealt with it, so I couldn't deal with hers. And then she said, like, snap the finger. She found herself outside of her window, looking at the emergency room entrance. Again, I thought, her room is above the emergency room entrance. Someone probably pushed her bed over the window, and, you know, she's not lying. She's just very sick and trying to put things together. Well, that excuse was also very lame because she was hooked up to a jillion things, you know. I mean, no one from housekeeping would unplug a critically ill person to clean under the bed and push your bed by that window. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. I was skipping over that because she wanted to skip over that because what she really wanted was someone to get a shoe that she had spotted on a ledge in a different part of the hospital during her resuscitation. And she just wanted someone to get the shoe. She knew it was there and her agitation wasn't negative. It was positive. She was very excited. So I went to look for the shoe, and I had the luck of the Kim, by the way. I started out on the outside of the building, and there were ledges everywhere, and it's, again, huge building. Then I saw a bird fly to the ledge. Then I didn't see the bird, so I thought, hey, I'm going to have to go inside. And where do I start again? I started on the opposite side of where I wound up. I went from room to room. The windows in the center part of Harborview were very long, almost to the floor. So this wasn't that big of a deal unless there was a a cart blocking the windows most of the time there wasn't i move now again maria was on the second floor in the north side of the building i was on the third floor in the center part of the building started out east nothing went north nothing went west and about midway in that west wing uh i'm not wing in the center wing on the west side I there was a cart in one of the rooms, so I had to go in, and they were all my ICU patients, so there was no disturbing. I, I need to make that clear. I would never walk into a room willy nilly of a sick person. I knew them all. 
they're all on my caseload. So, hi, John. Anyway, I went to the window and looked down, and there was a shoe exactly as Maria had described. She said it was grande. It was large. It was dark blue. Um, There was a white lace that went under the heel, and the little toe was scuffed up. Should I get it confused with any other shoe on a ledge? You know, such details. But I looked down, and, and there it was, this shoe. And that's when all of my jigsaw puzzle pieces fell into place. And I bonked my head in shock against the glass. My forehead hit the glass, and out loud I said, this happened to me. And I remember that moment of brief fogging from my breath on the window pane. And John, everything fell into place. Everything. It just came tumbling down. So I grabbed the shoe and did one last meanie thing. I went back into a room with the shoe behind my back and just, said, can you tell me about the inside of the shoe? Well, she couldn't because her perspective was from outside of the ledge, eyeball to shoelace. And then, you know, the dramatic moment of Viva Zapata, you know, I hold up the shoe like the Lion King, you know. (laughs) 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 So uh, that shoe, she was in the hospital for three weeks. That shoe became the Shroud of Turin of Harborview. The nurses are the ones that spread the story. No one. ever discounted her ever um and then it's not like she left my life i followed her an outpatient for three years i mean so this was a relationship i didn't just skim in and out of this woman's existence and then uh, i took a leave of absence one of my graduate students did my caseload came back and there was no maria i never saw her again but it wasn't a fly-by-night. But that story has urban legend status now. And thank you for giving me the time to share it because I've heard other people talk about that and get it wrong. And they're telling my story. And I'm Maria's advocate. So for your listeners, I mean, this is for the record. This is a horse's mouth, and you've just heard the story of the shoe on the ledge. But that's set forth in everything in the field of near-death experiences. And that's uh, not the only patient I had that spotted something remotely during a resuscitation, but that was the first. And that became my gig, so to speak, in academics. I started researching near-death experiences. And that led to lots of publications and lots of speaking opportunities around the world and and then writing a book and um starting the Seattle International Association for Near-Death Studies. Really important I mention that, or Seattle, I-A-N-D-S, and we're at .org after that. Um, Seattle IONS is now the oldest support group for near-death experiencers and similar spiritual experiencers in the world. And this is July, and in June, a month ago, we celebrated our 39th anniversary. So we're a, we're a regular, like, um, Seattle resource, open to the public, except during pandemic. And uh, I've been going for a long time. And at this point, someone thinks, someone who does bean counting and head counting, and that's not me, but thinks in 39 years we've had 10,000 separate signatures come through the door. But if you think about it, 39 years is a long time, and we average between 55 and 125 a meeting. But, and then for anyone who saw Netflix, Surviving Death, you'll see me in action at a Seattle Ions meeting, leading the group, welcoming people with heartfelt uh, gratitude to have said that word, cool and been sent back to serve. I'm excited to introduce our new sponsor, Feels. Feels is a better way to feel better. They make premium CBD that help with a number of issues, whether it's stress, anxiety, pain, trouble sleeping. Feels can help by providing a natural remedy. I've used CBD personally uh, here and there uh, with anxiety issues and you know occasional issues sleeping. Uh, I'm a huge fan of natural remedies. I think we've all taken medications that have tons of side effects that are zero fun. Well, Feels is a wonderful all-natural alternative that is non-addictive, side effect-free, and hassle-free. They deliver it directly to your door. Feels naturally helps, like I said, reduce things like stress, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness. They even have a couple great options depending on your preference. 
They have a CBD oil that you can drop under your tongue, or they just came out with these really cool CBD infused mints that'll help keep you clear headed and make your breath smell amazing. I just got some of the mints and they taste great with all the benefits of the oil. If you're new to CBD and have questions, Feels even offers this really cool free hotline that you can call and they'll help walk you through it, help you figure out the right dose for you. And if you love their product, you can join the Feels community to get Feels delivered to your door every month. And by doing that, you'll save money on every order. And if you don't like it, you can pause or cancel at any time. Become a member now and you'll get 40% off your first three months of membership just by using the code feels.com slash decon. Again, to become a member, go to F-E-A-L-S dot com slash decon, D-E-C-O-N, to save 40% off your first three months. Start feeling better with Feels. Joining the Feels monthly membership makes your self-care easy. You'll save money on every order, and you can pause or cancel at any time. Become a member today by going to feels.com slash decon. And again, you'll get 40% off your first three months with free shipping. You should be saving for the future, but savings accounts suck, and investing can be scary. We combine the ease of savings with the real returns of investing. We call it Save Vesting, and it's only available in our new app, Stairs. Stairs offers 4 to 6% returns, no fees, and you can withdraw anytime. Do your future a favor. Visit stairsapp.com today. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, and, and, and it occurs to me that you, you mentioned 10,000, potentially 10,000 signatures over the course of 39 years. And it occurs to me that those are just the ones in, you know, that, that came forward or were willing to tell their story. I, I, would, I would assume there are many others who are too afraid that people will look at them like they're insane and, and don't bring their stories forward. Right. Well, especially in the beginning. You know, going back 39 years ago, it was back to crazy making. I mean, things have changed. There's now lots of near-death experiencers who have published books, been on podcasts, been on television talk shows. I mean, I haven't met anyone in years who's never heard of a near-death experience. But those 10,000 aren't all near-death experiencers. There's people who attend who have had... um, a uh, spiritual transformative experience of some kind uh, who have lost a loved one. A lot of grieving people come to Seattle Ions because it is a place of hope and, and of love. I'll make sure that happens. Um, and then just the curious public. So it's not 10,000 in the ears, but it's 10,000 people served who come and leave feeling better about being alive. I hope. That's my goal. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the things that I would love to, for you to talk a little bit about is, and this is a, something that I've heard about in, in reading about these different uh, occurrences, uh, this idea that folks who, who have a near-death experience and come back from that have a really hard time adjusting to, to life after that. Talk about that a little bit. Well, then there's the social worker here. What an interesting field I found myself in. <laughs> yes, people come back, um, well, people being people, you, the reaction is so varied. It can sometimes be dramatic, but uh, people come back sometimes very sad because they're back in a life that involves pain or separation or um you know, bills to pay, (laughs) you name it. You know, they were off the big life hook and now they're back on. It's more like a meat hook. So um, there's that. Some people come back angry. Just, I just talked to someone last week who just so ticked off. It's like, I was in heaven. And I I can relate to all that. It's nice having had a near death experience when people are mad because they were sent back. I get that because I didn't think saying cool was an agreement. And so my joke, and I tell them, it's like, what, did I flunk heaven? I mean, (laughs) (laughs) what the heck? So I get along with the two above categories, the sad and the angry. 
Um, some people come back very confused and most people come back very different and that doesn't sit well with one's employer, spouse, neighbors, pastor, doctor, I mean, you name it. We don't like change. It's back to change needed and change does happen. The most extreme case, oh no, I can think of three extreme cases right now. Two lawyers and a drunk. Walk into a bar. No, that's another. <laughs> uh, but I'll talk about the drunk. A, uh, and, and this is actually an after the light. Um, anyway, a patient was admitted, and he was admitted like a corpse, frankly. I mean, medic one in Seattle, don't recess. You know, once you call 911, those men and women are, are on the scene, and they'll keep it up no matter what. Uh, so this, uh, in the book, he's Mr. Timmer because I never could find him, but his real name is Mr. John Zimmer. All the people I talk about have names. They've been in my lives. Anyway, um, he was not going to live. And so I was at the elevators waiting for the family with my Kimberly Clark Kleenex. I didn't ever leave that box very far behind. And instead of a grieving family, they were like, the doors open, it was partay. You know, they hated the guy. Turns out, he was a drunk. He was abusive. He was angry. You know what he used to do, John? He would be out in front. <laughs> he lived in a part of Seattle called Ballard, the section of town of very neat little you know lawns. And uh, he would be out front. And if a kid got too close to his front yard, he would stick his finger into the can of beer and then troll around and lob it at the child. Oh my gosh. He was an awful man. He was terrible. Well, Mr. Zimmer lived. He had a near-death experience. It changed him completely. He was too ill to go back to work. That was fine. He was of a retirement age. He spent the remaining of his days carving handmade wooden toys for children. He became like the Santa Claus of the neighborhood. All the kids loved him. All the neighbors loved him. His children, who were then adults, were so happy to have a father at any age that was a nice guy. He had such a dramatic change, but his wife divorced him because she had married an abusive drunk, and that wasn't her husband anymore. Wow. So the the changes, the after effects can affect people to that kind of extreme to, you know, hardly notice. Uh, Betty Preston, who co-founded Seattle Ions with me, was already a bit of an angel, you know. So (laughs) according to her family, she didn't change all that much. She was always just a darling. And uh, and then uh, in New Jersey, I met a gangsta. He was a nightclub owner, and he was a gangster. He changed a lot and became a devout Catholic. He's this side of a priest today. I mean, so... Again, after effects vary tremendously. Um, But not going back to one's previous existence seems to be what I would call the most common. Whatever new path is forged, uh, it's not the same as it was. The the near-death experiences, when they happen to people, they change people forever. Oh, you know what's also interesting? Dementia. I've now been around so many people. I know a lot of dead people now, to say the least, in 39 years of interviews. And um, a number of people uh, developed dementia before they died. Uh, Couldn't tell you who their daughter was, but never forgot their near-death experiences. Wow. uh, Yeah, that interests me. There's been no research on this at all. And uh, I'm not in a position to do that research now, but I... I'm very curious about it. The other thing is children, and that was research I was in on with Dr. Melvin Morris and part of a, a study we did at our local Seattle Children's Medical Center. And kids are also really interesting near-death experiencers because they haven't even grown up. And I also find their experiences to be so such strong evidence of this kind of experience because kids 
Uh, and the younger, the better I like them, by the way. They haven't been exposed to this subject. It's not like they've read all the books uh, or watched the movies or anything. And certainly they don't get up in the middle of the night and consult with each other. Hey, tomorrow I'm going to almost drown. And then wait till you see what I'm going to tell the parents. I mean, uh, I love children's stories. That could be a whole other broadcast with you, John, is just kids' stories. So, and children have their own kind of after effects, but not like adults. If going to the grocery store is a big deal, going to heaven is like right up there with, you know, Safeway. I mean, it's (laughs) so, whereas adults run around going, ah, you know, what happened to me? And am I crazy? And I'm leaving my wife. Children are basically like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I died. And, you know, saw a big light and saw my, you know, Poochie, our dead family dog. And give any gum. I mean, it's like, <laughs> wait, no what? Deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have to look at the age of people. And, and that kind of reaction, in my experience, goes up until about mid-teenage years. And then teenagers uh, have more to deal with than little kids. But adults have the most to deal with. I feel like I'm being vague. I hope that's not coming across. But I have so much to say on the subject and so little time to share. Yeah, it just it just seems like uh, kids are, are less jaded and consumed with all of the things that distract us in life that they're just kind of like, okay. Whereas adults, it's just, it's so, uh, we're so scientific by that point. So kind of stuck in our ways and, you know, shaped and molded by wow. life that it just, it's, a huge shock to the system. Yeah. And also, uh, doesn't make sense. Whereas children, you know, nothing makes sense. Really. <laughs> Everything's a, yeah. a learning curve. And, uh, but it is fun when, uh, I mean, again, I love interviewing children. Um, they're just so darn cute for one. <laughs> uh, the youngest we've ever had in a meeting was a little girl at age three. Wow. That is very, very young. We've also had a four-year-old and then up. Uh, but the three-year-old went to heaven and um, saw Jesus and wanted to bring Jesus a present. And Jesus was surrounded by other children. By the way, this is not a woman raised in Christianity. Mm, interesting but uh, not a fam not not a woman she's three her family wasn't a christian family so the expectation is not that their three-year-old come back and say yeah i saw jesus it's like what (laughs) (laughs) um anyway she wanted to give jesus a present so she leaned down to pick a flower for jesus and the flower communicated with her kind of alice in wonderland like and said nah i'm alive you know basically don't pick me she understood the flower. So then she saw a field mouse. So she scampered after the field mouse and captured it and cupped it in her hands and then went over and gave it to Jesus, who was delighted. So, which leads to, are there animals in the afterlife? Well, there are certainly field mice, but children who don't have uh, a lot of death in their lives. Usually grandparents are alive, aunts and uncles and friends and parents certainly are alive. But the family pet may be deceased. So uh, kids sometimes are reunited with their dogs or their cats and who are deceased, but that's who greets them. So I also tell people, because our pets, we can love as much as a human. And when they die, it hurts. My understanding, and I'm confident in this, is that we will be reunited with all we love, including critters and uh, things with fur and four feet or scales or, you know, I'm probably going to be greeted by goldfish that I killed flushing down the toilet when I was a kid. It's like, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just interesting. But these kinds of things bring comfort. And that's my job. Yeah, what, bringing comfort. One of the things I know we're running short on time, but I wanted to ask you real quick was, uh, and, and this is something I have a lot of family members in healthcare, a lot of nurses uh, in the family, some you know who who encounter death every day. You know, they're you know they work on floors where you know people are are dying, and 
and their job is to, to comfort them and to, you know, keep them in as little pain as possible, you know, while they transition. And, uh, one of the things that I, that I've read about is this phenomenon where, uh, they start to see loved ones who have, who have gone before them, who are deceased and they start to have visions of these, of these people. And I've, I've asked my relatives about this who are in healthcare. I'm like, oh yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> like, well, yeah, it ha- they're not phased by this at all, but they confirm the fact that, yeah, this happens all the time. Yep. It's so common. Deathbed visions. These are both near death experiences and deathbed visions are end of life events. And when we transition from our biology to, for lack of a better word, our spirituality, uh, something's got to give. And people begin to blend into another realm. Uh, deathbed visions are fascinating, particularly um, and near-death experiences, both, I guess, when someone who has died has been identified by the dying patient or the near-death experiencer without knowledge of their death. It's rare, but it happens. And one of those, again, I wrote this story up, is uh, one of my own patients who, during a resuscitation, saw his wife, Dusty, appear in uh, a ball of light that came towards him. Close, 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 opened up. There was Dusty beckoning to him. And he said, Kim, beckoning is not part of my vocabulary. But Dusty was beckoning, and she's dead. I was his wife. I, like, John, Dusty's not dead. I, Dusty's alive. Dusty wasn't. She had indeed died during his resuscitation. We have Boeing in Seattle, so there's a disproportionate number of engineers and John was a Boeing engineer. Engineers have a whole different way of thinking. They're, they're their own cats. I mean, they just do things organizationally different from mere mortals. And uh, John recovered, came back to me with a, a binder, three-ring binder, laminated pages, and inside was his, a copy of when he was resuscitated, that page of his own chart uh, with the chart notes. Uh, as it turns out, Dusty was in hospice. She was very sick, but not expected to die then. And John's heart attack actually might have been because he was trying too hard to take care of her. And um, so on next page, laminated, was the hospice nurse's notes on time of death. And because she died at home and wasn't expected to die at that time, this did go to the medical examiner, and there were the medical examiner's notes and his noted time of death, and they were all three the same. And there was no way for an unconscious, being resuscitated John to know that his wife Dusty had died at that moment. There'd be no way I would witness to that. So there's so many mysteries, so many things that happen. But you know what? We're all going to die. And I want to be the one to assure people that the the news is good. I'm not looking forward to dying. That's a process. That might involve pain (laughs) or not feeling good or expense. I mean, you know, I'm not thrilled about the exit. But once we're on the other side of what we call life, I promise people all is well, all is natural, and you will not be alone, and you will be loved. That's because we are loved. That's it's beautiful. already in place, actually. But yeah, yeah, we're all loved. Well, I think that's the perfect place to uh, to end this episode. So before we go, though, uh, your book "After the Light: The Spiritual Path to Purpose." Where can folks get a copy of that? And then, uh, of course, I, I want to plug the documentary as well. So talk a little bit about both of us. Okay. Well, um, after the light can be purchased. I mean, again, because of the pandemic, you know, bookstores aren't open, but um, I know it's in our library in Seattle. So you can check your library or get onto Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Uh, Both carry the book. Uh, It's a real book. It's, you know, hardback, book on tape, uh, Kindle, 
uh, paperback, uh, on demand, I mean, any possible form. So just look for After the Light. By the way, you can also Google me and get a whole bunch of me yapping too. Um, not a disembodied voice, but uh, I'm also on Google. Anyways, you can Google it. And then Netflix, um, the series, the documentary series is called Surviving Death. And episode one is on the near-death experience, and it's fantastic. And if you don't have Netflix, anyone can get Netflix free for one month. And it won't take a month to watch an hour episode. So you have the rest of the month to enjoy the universe that is Netflix, but you don't have to pay for that. That's true. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And after the light's been out there for a while, so you might even know someone who has a copy and you can borrow it. And I want people to read it, but I'm not pushing the purchase of it. But there's a lot of good stuff in there. A lot of things we talk about, but uh, expounded upon in the book. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I highly encourage folks to go get it because obviously we could have we could have talked for three hours and barely touched the surface of uh, of this topic. So uh, folks, go out and get it. I'll have all the links in the show notes, so uh, you can go there and, and click away. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on the show. This is absolutely fascinating, and uh, you're a delightful person to talk to about this. So thank you. Well, John, I, right back at you. I mean, I've really enjoyed this. You're, uh, no one can see your face but me, but you're a doll. I mean, <laughs> you, you just Thank have you. that kind of, per, you're just that person that, you know, you're nice, you're non judgmental, you're intelligent, uh, and you're curious. Well, thank that you. makes for interesting people, and you're one of them. So, right back at you. I appreciate that. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that that compliment and uh, <laughs> and run with it. So, okay, we'll we'll definitely have, have to have you back on, and and we'll we'll cover even more ground. But thank you so much. Yeah, and it would be my pleasure. And thank you again. Does life continue after the death of the physical body? Does our consciousness transcend into another state of existence? If so, will we ever have concrete evidence, or will we all just have to wait until we draw our final breath? Then again, if we did know the answer, like in the movie The Discovery, might it rob life of its essence? So perhaps it's better if we don't know. Thanks again for listening to Season 1 of From the Void. If you like the show, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a future episode of the show. And if you have a second, please consider leaving us a five-star review on iTunes. It helps spread the word and helps get us noticed. And as always, word of mouth is the best way to help spread the word. I'll be back very, very soon with all new mysteries on Season 2 of From the Void. Look out for the trailer for a sneak peek at what's in store. And until then... Thanks for listening.